Shalom, brothers and sisters. This week, I want to talk to you guys about something that means a bit to me and that I find interesting, and I, and I hope you find it interesting too. I want to start by reading scripture in the Universal Book of Mormon. We're in 1 Nephi 146, 215, and my father dwelt in a tent. Many years ago, before Christine and I even met each other, let alone got married, I was asked to share a scripture to open an activity at Institute from the Book of Mormon. And this is the one that I felt impressed by the Spirit to share. And when the Institute director discovered what scripture I'd be reading, he got a little nervous and I didn't really know why. And I really didn't know why I was sharing the scripture. I thought it was interesting that the Lord placed it on my heart. And I found it interesting that it's this one little sentence that sits off by itself. And so I thought, what could the deeper meaning be here? And what I came up with that day was the idea that Lehi was, was obviously wealthy because Laban coveted his things so much that he was willing to break another commandment and murder Lehi's sons to get his, his goods, his, his earthly possessions. And yet Lehi gave it all up to live in a tent. And I thought, wow, this is a great message. And I shared that message. And the Institute director, he thanked me, said it was a good message. And I asked him, I said, you seemed a little nervous about me sharing this particular scripture. And he said, yeah, there's some people that have some weird ideas about that. I was like, oh, what are the weird ideas? Said, well, I don't, I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to get you down a, a strange path. So don't worry about that. I, I think what you shared was good and just stick with that. But I felt that there was something more. And when he said that, I felt like that was the Holy Spirit letting me know that was God talking through him to let me know there's more to this. So I kept studying it. I kept thinking about it. Over the years, I continued to share this scripture with the same message because I figured if I had the Institute director's approval, then, then it was probably okay. But I still wondered what that deeper meaning was. Why? Why did Nephi go out of his way to tell us that his father dwelt in a tent? And why did that scripture make this Institute director uncomfortable? Years later, in 2019, I celebrated Sukkot for the first time in Missouri. And while I was there, I discovered that many of the people there, or some of the people there, were wearing a tzitzit. This is something that we are commanded to wear in the Torah, both in the Old Testament and on the plates of brass. Should you wear it? I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. The Talit is a prayer shawl. It's worn by Jews, Messianic Christians, Messianic Mormons. I have several. I use them. And Talit means little tent. So the idea that Lehi's father dwelt in the tent, I think there's a tie there to the Zitzits and the Talit. And what I want to do today is I want to go over some things I find interesting in the Book of Mormon that I think are hints to the Talit and the Zitzit. And I am going to discuss the question, should you be using a Talit? Should you wear the Zitzits? But I want to start off today by reading a scripture from the Bible and then one also from the plates of brass that tell us what the Zitzit is. In the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, or the Torah, chapter 15, Speak unto Israel, say unto them that they are to make for themselves tzitzits on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and they are to put a blue cord on each tzitzit, and it will be your own tzitzit, so whenever you look upon them, you will remember all the mitzvot of the Lord, and do them, and not go spying out after your own hearts and your own eyes, prostituting yourselves. That's from the Tree of Life translation. This is recorded a little bit differently in the plates of brass. In 4th Moses it says, Thou shalt make tzitzits in the four corners of thy garments throughout all your generations. And thou shalt put upon the tzitzits a blue thread. And it shall be unto thee for a protection, that thou shalt look upon it and remember all thy mitzvah unto me and do them. And thou shalt remember that Israel is a holy people, a nation of kings and queens and priests and priestesses. 
So there's some similarities and some differences here. In the Bible, we're told to wear them. To how, we're told how to wear them the same way in both. But in the Bible, we're told to wear them to remember our covenants and so that we don't pollute ourselves. But in the plates of brass, we're told to wear them to remember our covenants and also to remember who we are, that we're kings and queens, priests and priestesses. So I find it very interesting that one is a bit of a negative and the other is a bit of a positive. And I think that they're both accurate. I think we need to put them together to get the full story. But let's look again at the Book of Mormon. So we know that Nephi would have had the second scripture that I read. He would be wearing it to remember who he is. That he is a king and a priest. And at one point, Nephi has a vision of Jesus. And how does he describe that vision? Let's take a look. In the Universal Book of Mormon, we're in 11, 22, 25, 13. Behold, they will crucify him, speaking of Jesus Christ. And after he is laid in a sepulcher for the space of three days, he shall rise from the dead with healing in his wings. Now, that idea of having healing in his wings is also found in the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi when Jesus quotes Malachi. And I want to read that to you real quick. In the Universal Book of Mormon, this is 3 Nephi 11, 23, 25, 2. In Malachi, it would be chapter 4, verse 2. And it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now, both of these talk about having healing, about Jesus having healing in his wings. And a lot of people tie that idea of the healing in his wings to the woman who grabs his, the corner of his cloak and is healed from her illness. She'd been sick for years, but her faith makes her whole because she grabs the corner. Now, what does that have to do with wings and grabbing a corner? What does this have to do with, with the zitzit? Well, Another way to translate this isn't merely fringe, it's also wing or wings. When you talk about angels having wings, probably not talking about bird wings. We're probably talking about these, some sort of heavenly version of these. And here, when the woman went to grab the corner, what's on the corner of his garment? She's grabbing his zitzit. She's probably grabbing the corner of his talit. So I think that this is a hint. I think that Nephi understood this and anyone who is, is Jewish and reads his prophecy, which by the way, his prophecy, he didn't have Malachi. Malachi came after Nephi and yet he still saw the same thing and used a very similar language, not word for word, but he still used the idea of the wings. And I, I think that that's, that's very, very telling. So what does that say about us and this idea of wearing a seat or using a talit? Let's take a look at another scripture. In Alma 1, 102, 3, 4, it says that the Amalekites were distinguished from the Nephites, for they had marked themselves with red in their foreheads after the manner of the Lamanites. Nevertheless, they had not shorn their heads like unto the Lamanites. Skipping ahead, 1, 111, 313. Now we will return again to the Amalekites, for they also had a mark set upon them. Yea, they set a mark upon themselves, yea, even a mark of red upon their foreheads. And why? Skipping ahead to 1, 113, 314b. Behold, the Lamanites I have cursed, God says. I will set a mark upon them, that they and their seed may be separated from thee and thy seed from this time henceforth and forever, except they repent of their wickedness, and turn to me that I may have mercy upon them. So what was this mark that he set upon them? Apparently, this red upon their foreheads. And I'm going to read one last verse here. Alma 1, 117, 318a. 
Now the Amalekites knew not that they were fulfilling the words of God when they began to mark themselves in their foreheads. Nevertheless, they come out in open rebellion against God. Therefore, it is expedient that the curse should fall upon them. Now, I know what you're thinking. What does this red mark on your forehead have to do with white and blue string? This evidence, if you want to even call it that, is definitely circumstantial. What I want to do is paint a picture for you. You have the plates of brass in, in your, maybe not personally in your house, but you're growing up in a culture where that's the scriptures. And so you've been taught to wear the seats, whatever that meant for the Nephites. Now suddenly you're throwing this away and you're going after the Lamanites and you're putting a red mark on your forehead. One of the ways you can translate tzitzit is fringe. One, another is wings. Another is a lock of hair. Hair goes on your head. I, I think that to a culture that wears this tassel or wing or lock of hair on the corner of their garments to put a red mark on their forehead, whether they realize it or not, is a statement. A statement saying that you are rejecting the covenant. And we know that's what it was because that was a sign of their curse of the Lamanites. So what does that mean for us? I believe that as Christians, we've given ourselves many, many ways to mark ourselves as the people of Christ. We wear crosses. Is that bad? No, of course not. I grew up wearing the CTR ring. Choose the right. Is that wrong? No, of course not. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, there was the, what would Jesus do bracelets, rings and other jewelry? Is that wrong? No. Of course not. There's the fish. You see the fish and bumper stickers all the time. Is that wrong? No. Is it scriptural? No. Neither celebrating Christmas. I do that too. What is in the scriptures is the tzitzit. Whether we do that by wearing a talit, the little tent, I put these on my belt loops or on my belt itself if I don't have a loop there so that it's on my four corners. I'm wearing them right now. Because this is the sign that the Lord asked us to wear so that people would know and that we would remember that we are the covenant people. And why? Why do we wear these? Is it just a sign? Is it just to let the world know that we're Christians? No. We wear them as a remembrance of who we are and who the Lord has called us to be. We wear them to remember the covenant path. That's what the blue thread is for. It's also to remind us that we are kings and queens and priests and priestesses. And what does that mean? Unfortunately, in our society, we have this idea that if someone is a king or a queen, that means that they're rulers that must be obeyed. If they're a priest or priestess, it's a similar type of thing. There's some sort of religious expert who's all-knowing and must be obeyed. That's not what a king, a queen, and a priest and a priestess are in the eyes of the Lord. And that's the other reason why we wear this, to remember that we are servants. Jesus is the king of kings. He is the great high priest. And what did he do? He descended below us all. Why? To set the example. We're not supposed to rise above Jesus. We're not supposed to rise above God. That was Lucifer's sin, right? We wear these to remember that the Lord has called us to serve people. Helping meet their physical needs and their spiritual needs. We wear these so people know, you need help? The Lord has called me to help you. 
The Lord has called me to serve you. So these are worn so people know who we are, so that we remember who we are. And so that people know, if they know what this means, that's a servant of the Lord. That's someone that I can go to if I need help. And brothers and sisters, that's what it means to serve the Lord. That's what it means to love the Lord, to serve others, to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to love and heal this creation. And we cannot forget this. And that's why I wear the talit, to remind me of who I am, who I'm called to be, and that is to serve all of you. Does that mean that you have to wear this? In Doctrines of the Saints, section 124, the Council of Elders had asked me to ask the Lord about building a tabernacle rather than a temple because we didn't have the money to build a temple at that time. And in verse 12, the Lord said to me, Have I not asked thee to wear the tzitzits? And are these not a sign that ye are a royal generation, even a royal priesthood in my name? And when I received this, I thought to myself, Oh, yeah, I received the revelation on this. But it says ye, not thou. So it's not just referring to me. So therefore, everyone that the Lord has asked to wear the seats, this revelation about the tabernacle is talking to them. And it says why we wear them in verse 13. And ye are the kings and queens, even the priests and priestesses of the Most High God. Therefore, ye are worthy. So one of the reasons why we wear these is because we are worthy to wear them. They're not just a sign of the covenant. They're a sign that we've been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, and therefore we are worthy to be called his people. Section 135 is the revelation on the tzitzits. And the first question I ask in verse 1 is, what are the tzitzits and are we to wear them? And there he repeats some verses from Deuteronomy in chapter 23. And in verse 9, the Lord says, All they that do hear my voice and that are moved by my spirit to wear them shall put on the tzitzits. And this is not to be seen, but that my people shall see, and that those who wear them shall know their kin, and where to find safety in my wings, for the tzitzits are my wings. In verse 21, I ask the question, is everyone required to wear the tzitzits? And in verse 22, the Lord says, Behold, thy mitzvah is written in my Torah, and I did show unto thee the Torah lived in me as I walked the earth and taught my people, and I did keep all of the Torah. Therefore I say unto thee that all who read this should come unto me with a broken heart and contrite spirit and ask the Father in my name, even as thou did, David, to know my will for themselves. So, brothers and sisters, the message I have for you today is very simple. I wear the tzitzits because I went to the Lord and I asked and he told me to wear them. Now, if you go to the Lord and the Lord tells you don't wear them, don't. I will support you 120%. If he tells you to wear them, wear them. I will support you 120%. I think the key here, though, there's, there's two keys here in my mind. The first one is that these are a symbol of who we are. The Lord's very clear on that. You want to wear something so people know that we are Christians, that we belong to Jesus Christ, this is what the scriptures say to wear. Doesn't mean you can't wear anything else. I do. I have a cross necklace. I have a necklace with the star David on it. I, I have many things that I wear that signify that I am a Christian. This just happens to be one of them. And this just so happens to be the one that the Lord specifically told me to wear in the scriptures and in personal revelation. But the second part to me is more important because it's the invitation from the Lord. The scriptures say something. What does it mean for you? If we're to be a prophetic people, we can't just assume 
what the scriptures say or what they mean. And just because the Lord commands one person to do something or asks or instructs one person to do something doesn't mean that everyone is required to do that thing. So are you invited by the Lord? Because I don't see this as a commandment. This isn't hard. I see this as something that we are invited to do. So are you invited to wear the tzitzit? Ask and maybe the invitation is to buy a talit and wear it when you pray. Wear it when you're doing your temple services. Maybe it's to put it on your belt. Maybe it's to tie it to the hems of your of your dress or other your coat or other garments. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that I trust you to go to the Lord and ask for yourself and receive that revelation. And that's really my message today. It's not really about the seats. Zitz what I'm really trying to do here, I'm just going to be blunt and say it, is get you to go to the Lord. Seek guidance and ask for a revelation because we are a prophetic people and that's what we do. If this video has helped you in any way, I would like to invite you now to please like it and share it with others. If you want more messages of hope, please make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. Brothers and sisters, hope is something that, unfortunately in this world, many, many people are trying to take away from us right now. And so these messages of hope from the Book of Mormon that I'm sharing with you every week, they're very, very important to me. And it's very, very important to me that they get out into the world to make the world a more positive place. And if 10 people see this video and it brings hope to one of you, that is God in action. If 100 people see it and it brings hope to one of you, that is still God in action. Brothers and sisters, if we can share these messages of hope, not just through a video, but by being hope to others, being a little kinder, reminding people that there is love, there is good in this world. That's what it means to be a member of the Fellowship of Christ. That's what it means to be a Latter-day Saint. That's what it means to be a Christian. So, I really, really hope, I have hope that these videos, these efforts that I'm making here are making a difference in your life. And I hope that in turn, you are making a difference in the lives of those around you. If you'd like to know more about the fellowship, check out our website, cjccf.org. If you would like to have any questions for us or would like to know more about us, feel free to email us info at cjccf.org. And until next time, shalom and God bless.